Bundy into his windup. Here's the pitch. Swung on and missed a perfect game. Swung on as a high drive to left. Palomino going back. And the ball is going, going down. Back to throw. There's a left. He can't get it. It's off the wall for a base hit. Here comes the tying run, and here comes the winning run. There's a new home run champion of all time, and it's Henry Aaron. I don't believe what I just saw. I don't believe what I just saw. everybody this is pat hughes welcome to baseball voices the hall of fame series today we spotlight the scintillating career of the voice of the cincinnati reds marty brenneman hit number 41 92 here comes concepcion poland boots the ball and the 1976 pennant belongs to the red and tom browning has pitched a perfect game. Junior has just knocked the door down to the 500 club. And the 1990 World Championship belongs to the Cincinnati Reds. There are many reasons why Cincinnati Reds fans have loved Marty Brenneman for all these years. His voice is easy to listen to, with a pleasing inflection that evokes his southern upbringing. He's articulate, accurate, and consistently prepared to announce a ball game every day. He's compelling, opinionated, and as honest as a broadcaster can possibly be. Marty can deliver great drama when necessary, but with his humor, charm, and natural talent, he also could often make a dull game sound interesting. Compared to other baseball announcers, Marty has had more than his share of opportunities to call historic plays and games, including Henry Aaron's 714th home run, the record-setting base hit by Pete Rose, Tom Browning's perfect game, a no-hitter by Tom Seaver, Ken Griffey Jr.'s 500th homer, and three Cincinnati Reds World Championship seasons. Sure, he's been fortunate to be in the right place at the right time on numerous occasions, but the Cincinnati Reds and their fans have been lucky as well to have had Marty Brenneman as their great radio voice since 1974. In the summer of the year 2000, Marty received the ultimate honor for a baseball announcer, the Ford C. Frick Award in ceremonies at the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. The induction officially puts Marty into the legendary category, along with, among others, men like Vin Scully, Mel Allen, and the first two subjects of this series, Harry Carey and Jack Buck. Please sit back and enjoy the story of the extraordinary career of Marty Brenneman, the voice of the Reds. In the fall of 2006, as he was wrapping up his 33rd season in Cincinnati, Marty Brenneman talked about his very favorite Reds team. I think most people would be inclined to think I would say the big red machine teams, and that's not true. My favorite Reds team would be the 1990 team that won the world championship because when the season began in that April uh, in 1990, nobody gave that team a chance to do anything, much less get to the postseason or win a world championship. 1989 had been a painful one for the Reds. Marty has called it the toughest year he has spent in his career. Not only did they finish in fifth place and 12 games under 500, but the Pete Rose gambling controversy put a dark cloud over the organization. When Rose was banned from baseball on August 24, 1989, the Reds needed a new manager, and Lou Pinella was hired to run the show in 1990. On opening night in Houston, the Reds and Astros were deadlocked in the 11th inning. With the bases loaded, Barry Larkin was at the plate, and Marty Brenneman was on the call. Barry waits. Here comes a pitch, and he lines a base hit into right center field. 
One run scores. Here comes the second run. The third run being waved around. Chris Sabo and going to third with a stand-up triple is Barry Larkin. And Cincinnati has taken a 7-4 11th inning lead. The Reds jumped out of the gate, winning their first nine games, and they never looked back, becoming the first team to go wire-to-wire -to, -wire to a world title since divisional play began in 1969. The Reds enjoyed a record of 30-12 and 12 at the end of May, and on the 16th of June, the trio of Chris Sabo, Barry Larkin, and Eric Davis went back-to-back-to-back. To back to back. He throws to the plate, and Sabo swings! There it goes! It's gone! Chalk it up, home run, left field, number 13, Reds lead 3-2. And a fly ball, left field, that might go also, and it will. Back-to-back -back home run. And Davis sends it way back into left center field, and that's gone. Three straight home runs. The Reds' offense was more than adequate, but more often than not, pitching is what wins baseball games, and the Reds' staff allowed the fewest runs in the National League. The starting rotation was spearheaded by Tom Browning and Jose Rijo. Between them, they achieved 29 victories. But any discussion of the 1990 Reds pitching staff quickly has to include the Nasty Boys, the vaunted bullpen trio of Randy Myers, Rob Dibble, and Norm Charlton. Myers saved 31 games, Dibble saved 11 with an ERA of under 2, and Charlton, who also made 16 starts, chalked up 12 wins. They were simply the best bullpen in baseball. And Myers goes to pacing again. He always comes straight off the mound, goes to the third base side, and comes right back on top. And now they're standing here at Riverfront. Oliver sends out the sign to left-hander Randy Myers. He straightens up, and he turns it loose. A swing and a miss! And this one belongs to the Reds. The Nasty Boys were flat nasty with a capital N here in the ninth inning. Defense was also a major strength of that 1990 Reds ball club. They committed the fewest errors of any team in the league. Let's hear Marty describing a big play by right fielder Paul O'Neill. Browning pitching and McGee swinging. Fly ball hit well back into right field. O'Neill going back. Warning track near the wall. Leaping. He got it. He took a home run away from it. Paul O'Neill went over the wall and stole one from Willie McGee. Well, you can put a star by that one. On August 21st against the Chicago Cubs, Reds manager Lou Pinella put on a show that was worth the price of admission. Larkin grounds it to the left side. Ramos goes to Sandberg to throw on to first. They got him. The double play ends the inning. Larkin doesn't agree with the call, nor does Tony Perez, nor does Lou Pinella who runs right out there to get in the face of Dutch Renner. He slams his hat down, and Renner has thrown him out. Lou has now gone to the first base bag, picks it up, and throws it out towards short right field. And he's going to pick it up again and throw it further out in right field. I'll tell you what, this is the best act we've seen this year. The Reds stayed in first place all season long, and with their magic number down to one, they actually clinched the division title on September 29th during a rain delay in Cincinnati. Marty was delighted to be the one to deliver the good news to Reds fans. Well, we are happy to report that as of 6.05 Cincinnati time, the Reds have won the National League Western Division Championship. The San Francisco Giants have defeated the Los Angeles Dodgers 4-3 to three at Candlestick Park. It makes no difference what transpires from here on out at Riverfront. The Dodgers have fallen to the Giants, and the Reds, for the first time in 11 years, are reigning as National League Western Division champion. The 1990 National League Championship Series against the Pittsburgh Pirates began in Cincinnati. After splitting the first two games, the series shifted to Three Rivers Stadium. With Game 3 tied at 2-2 two to two in the fifth inning, Reds infielder Mariano Duncan came through in certainly the turning point of the game, and maybe of the entire NLCS. First and third occupied, one out. And Duncan hits a high, deep drive. Way back in left center field. That ball is out of here. Three-run home run by Mariano Duncan. 
on an 0-1 pitch from Zane Smith. The Reds have played long ball for the second time today, and they jump back out in front 5-2. That led to a 6-3 Reds win and a 2-1 series advantage. Game four was a cliffhanger with the Reds clinging to a 4-3 lead in the bottom of the eighth when Pirates slugger Bobby Bonilla got a hold of one, allowing Reds outfielder Eric Davis to make one of the most famous throws in Reds history. And here's a line shot to deep center field. Going back is Hatcher at the wall, leaping. He cannot get it. Bonilla comes to second. He's going to try for three. Here comes a throw, and they got him. They knock him off. Eric Davis with a perfect throw. He came over from left field, took the ball off the wall, and fired a one-bound strike to Chris Sabo, and Bonilla is gone. Davis' breathtaking peg preserved the victory, and the Reds were just one win away from the pennant. The Buccos stayed alive by winning Game 5, but it was back to Ohio for Game 6. Reds' pitching had carried the load all year, and it vaulted them into the World Series. A collaborative one-hitter by Danny Jackson, Norm Charlton, and Randy Myers stymied the Pirates. And pinch hitter Luis Quinones' clutch seventh-inning RBI single created a 2-1 to Cincinnati lead going into the ninth inning. They cheer and they groan here at the ballpark. 56,079. Myers an out away. A strike away. Working to Don Slott with a 2-2 pitch. Here it comes. And he struck him out swinging. And the 1990 National League Championship belongs to the Cincinnati Reds. In the World Series, the Reds would play a team, the Oakland A's, that was thinking dynasty. The A's had swept the San Francisco Giants in the 1989 Fall Classic. And in 1990, they breezed to 103 regular season wins and then crushed Boston four straight in the ALCS. Oakland featured a star-studded bunch. Sluggers Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco, 20-game winners Dave Stewart and Bob Welch, and a nearly invincible closer in Dennis Eckersley. But the Cincinnati Reds were performing at the very top of their game, and so was Marty Brenneman. Eric Davis of the Reds may very well have set the tone for the entire World Series in the first inning of Game 1. Hatcher running. The pitch is swung on. A high, deep drive to center field. It may go. It will. Home run. Eric Davis explodes the first pitch thrown by Dave Stewart onto the concourse in center field. Hatcher scores in front of him, and Cincinnati has taken a first inning two to nothing lead. In that opener, Jose Rijo blanketed the A's and the Reds posted an easy 7-0 win. Game 2 was a nail-biter all tied up at 4-4 in the ninth inning. Now here's something you don't hear every day. With extra innings looming and the Reds running out of pitchers, Marty made a startling announcement. We've got a rather unusual message. We understand that Tom Browning's wife Debbie has gone into labor. He has left the ballpark. And a call apparently has just come up from the Reds clubhouse to make an appeal over our airwaves for Tom Browning to come back to the ballpark in the event that they have to use him to pitch tonight. As it turned out, Browning wasn't needed, but that was an extraordinary piece of baseball on the radio. Against Eckersley, Joe Oliver's game-winning single over the third base bag gave the Reds a thrilling 5-4 decision in 10 innings and a 2-0 series edge. The series shifted out to Oakland for Game 3. Third baseman Chris Sabo cracked a pair of home runs, including a two-run blast during a frolicsome seven-run rally in the Reds' third inning. Cincinnati coasted to an 8-3 win and moved to the threshold of a world title. Game 4 was staged on October 20th. Series MVP Jose Rijo outpitched Dave Stewart for the second time in the series, retiring 20 consecutive Oakland batters at one point. The Reds scored twice in the eighth inning and led 2-1 to one in the ninth. Lou Pinella handed the ball over to Randy Myers, and Marty Brenneman made one of his most famous Reds radio calls. Myers underhanding the ball that Ted Hendry gave to him and gets a new one back and typically goes to the third base side of the mound and walks straight up to the pitching rubber. Lansford, good hitting Oakland third baseman, steps in, levels a bat. 
And Myers bringing it. And the pitch is hit in the air. Foul off first. Benzinger backing and calling. And the 1990 World Championship belongs to the Cincinnati Reds. As you might expect, they pile out of the dugout. They are jumping up and high-fiving. All smiles as Lou Pinella and his coaching staff break out of the dugout. Gloves and caps all over the infield. The Cincinnati Reds have done the absolute improbable by defeating the club considered to be the best in Major League Baseball, and they've done it in a four-game series sweep. Years later, Marty discussed some of the intangibles of that ball club. The greatest chemistry, the greatest togetherness of any team I've ever been around. There were no clicks on that team. Everybody liked one another, black, white, Hispanic. It didn't make any difference. And they were just a, a wonderful team to watch play. So I would say the 90 Club, to me, was, uh, was my favorite team. We will listen to many more of Marty's greatest career moments. But first, let's go back to his younger days. Chester Martin Brenneman was born on July 28, 1942 in Portsmouth, Virginia, located near the southern tip of Chesapeake Bay, adjacent to the Atlantic Ocean. It was a middle-class childhood for Marty and his younger brother Tom. Their father worked in a naval shipyard and as a salesman and as the manager of a pet dairy. Marty's mother was a longtime employee of the phone company. Even though he loved sports by his own admission, Marty was not a great schoolboy athlete. He was a left-handed thrower and batter in Little League and played right field on a team called Chubby's, which was a restaurant. As a diminutive 95-pound high school freshman, he tried out for quarterback. He was actually so small they couldn't find a uniform to fit him. Secretly, he was greatly relieved when he was cut from the football team. Young Marty also enjoyed acting and theater, as an eight-year-old in a Wizard of Oz production, he landed the coveted role of Toto. He was in all the school plays and aspired to be a professional performer someday. Also in his senior year at Woodrow Wilson High School in Portsmouth, Marty Brenneman was elected student body president. Upon graduation, he enrolled at Randolph-Macon College in Ashland, Virginia, and then, in his junior year, transferred to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He majored in radio, television, motion pictures and graduated in early 65. Recently, Marty reflected back upon some of the announcers he had listened to and who had influenced his own career. When I was a kid growing up in Virginia, I used to listen to the Washington Senators and used to listen to the Baltimore Orioles and the Orioles were done by Chuck Thompson and uh, Bill O'Donnell. And they were a great, great broadcast team. The Senators, Arch McDonald. John McClain, and I listened to a guy who recreated Brooklyn Dodger baseball games named Nat Albright. I didn't even know what a recreation was. I was not a Dodger fan, but I was so enthralled by listening to him, and naturally, as a kid in the 50s, I thought they were live broadcasts. I, again, I had no idea what a recreation was, and he recreated every single Brooklyn Dodger game, I guess from a studio in Northern Virginia, and the guy was just magnificent to the extent that early in, in this century, probably 2001, 2002, I found out he was still alive in Northern Virginia, and I got his phone number, and I called him. And I said, you don't know who I am, but I just want you to know that you were an incredible influence on my one day getting into the business I'm in. And we had a great conversation. We talked for probably 30 minutes, and, and uh I felt better about the call after I'd called him because uh, he was along in years and was no longer in the broadcast business. And I called from spring training at my place down in Siesta Key, and I told my wife, I said, I would like to think that if there's some young guy who was influenced enough by listening to me, that he would one day pick up the phone and call me and tell me the same thing. After I got into the business, when I got out of college, you know, when I went to Carolina and Chapel Hill, got out of school, I used to listen to Milo Hamilton do the Atlanta Braves games after they left Milwaukee and came to Atlanta. And I listened to him a lot when I was working in a small station in North Carolina. Uh, Bob Prince was a big influence on me and probably was more helpful to me when I came to the big leagues to give me do's and don'ts, things that stood me in good stead 
more than any other broadcaster. He was wonderful to me. Marty's broadcasting career began in 1965 at WGHP-TV in High Point, North Carolina. His first play-by-play assignment was a high school football game in the Tar Heel State in the town of Salisbury. In one of his first big breaks in 1970, Marty was hired to be the radio voice of the Virginia Squires of the old American Basketball Association. The Squires featured some guys who could really play, like Doug Moe, Larry Brown, and Charlie Scott. Marty enjoyed his time in the ABA, and he liked it even more when the famous Julius Irving, Dr. J, joined the Squires in 1971. Marty loved describing Irving's incredible athletic grace, and he once witnessed a 53-point, 31-rebound Dr. J performance. Even after getting the Reds job, Marty continued to announce college basketball games, including 15 NCAA regional tournaments and 11 Final Fours. In fact, he was working the play-by-play on CBS radio for one of the greatest basketball games ever played, the 1992 regional final between Duke and Kentucky that went into overtime. With Duke down by a point and needing a miracle with only two seconds remaining, here's Marty's call. It will be Grant Hill to make the pass. They're not going to guard Hill making the inbounds pass. Here's a high looper. There's Leitner. He turns. He shoots. It is good. Christian Leitner hits a turnaround 17-footer at the buzzer. And the Duke Blue Devils head to Minneapolis. My, oh, my, oh, my. A perfectly thrown pass by Grant Hill. Leitner caught it at the other end with his back to the basket at the free throw line. He spun to his left. He launched. It got nothing but the bottom of the well. And the Kentucky Wildcats lose to the Duke Blue Devils in overtime, 104 to 103. Marty Brenneman began his baseball announcing career in 1971 with the Tidewater Tides of the International League. Just three years later, he would be calling Henry Aaron's 714th home run. When Al Michaels left the Reds after the 1973 season, there were 221 applications for the job opening. Marty tells the story of getting hired by the Reds. I was recommended to the Reds by Dave Rosenfield, who was a general manager of the club down there and still is today, uh, to Dick Wagner, who was the assistant general manager at the winter meetings in November of, of 73. So they flew me in. I was in Indianapolis with the Squires to play the Pacers, and the Reds flew me into Cincinnati on a Wednesday, and the, Red, and the Squires and the Pacers were playing on a Friday night. And I flew in, and I interviewed – all day Thursday, and uh, then they took me back to the hotel, and uh, I was flying into Indianapolis from Cincinnati, which is a short jaunt that Thursday night, and I got back to the hotel and uh, they because they had told me, I will call you. I got back to the hotel, packing my stuff up to go to Indianapolis. I get a call. They want to bring me back to the stadium and offer me the job. It was, it was a complete turnaround because they said, we'll get back in touch with you. And uh, so I came back to the ballpark and at Riverfront, and Dick Wagner was the general manager, or assistant general manager, and he offered me the job. And I said, "Well, can I let you know?" And he was stunned. He said, "You get a chance to come to the big leagues and broadcast Major League Baseball." I said, "I realize that, but I also feel like I got to go back to Virginia Beach and 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 talk to my wife and and talk it over, and I, I'll let you know on Sunday night." And they were shocked. And I came back home after doing the game in Indianapolis. Came back home, talked to her, called them at sun, Sunday afternoon, 5 o'clock, said, I'll take the job. Marty has one vivid recollection of his first big league spring training in 1974. The Reds opened that spring at Bradenton, Florida against the Pirates, and I was scared to death about that broadcast. Got through it without any basic problems and felt uh, going into the first game in Tampa at Lopez Field against the White Sox that uh, the weight of the world was off my shoulders. The ghost of Al Michaels was gone. Uh, I didn't realize what was coming up. The engineer cued me, and my first line was, Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Al Michaels Field. Marty recovered from that little faux pas, and shortly thereafter, he would be all fired up for his first Major League opening day. And what an unforgettable debut it was.
Henry Aaron began the 1974 season needing just one homer to tie the legendary Babe Ruth. Aaron's Atlanta Braves just happened to be in Cincinnati to play the Reds on April 4, 1974. It was the first regular season broadcast for the Reds' rookie announcer, 31-year-old Marty Brenneman. Hammer and Hank wasted no time in making history, and Marty recalled the moment. Happened in the first inning of the first game I ever did. It was unreal. Braves get two on, and Jack Billingham's pitching, and Jack falls behind to Henry three balls in one strike, and the next pitch he hits a line drive over the fence and left, and the call's not bad for a guy who was completely out of it to the extent he really didn't even know what he was doing. Here's how it sounded on station WLW in Cincinnati and the Reds radio network. Outfield shaded around toward left for Aaron. Billingham with a pause, the 3-1 pitch, swung on, long shot, into deep left field, Rose is back, and that ball is gone! A home run! Henry Aaron has just tied Babe Ruth's home run record of 714 with a cloud over the 375 marker in left field. The Braves are piling out of the dugout. The crowd is on its feet in mass here at Riverfront Stadium as Hank Aaron has just hammered a 3-1 pitch from Jack Billingham over the left field wall, and the Braves are out front 3-0. As historic and memorable as that first opening day was for Marty, he only felt like he really arrived as the voice of the Reds a few months later. My favorite play-by-play -play moment was the first year I was with the club in 74, and it was the first day back after the three-day All-Star break, and the Reds were playing a, a 20 doubleheader against the San Francisco Giants at Riverfront. And I'd gone a half a year and felt like I'd done a pretty good job, but uh, I don't think that I had ever really felt that I belonged. My acceptance by the fan had been very, very good. Uh, and then the first game of that doubleheader against the Giants, the Reds came to bat in the bottom of the ninth inning, a game one behind 13-9. to nine. But the Reds rallied for three runs to trail by only one. And with two outs and a man on, Tony Perez took center stage. The pitch. Fly ball! Center field! It's all over! It's all over! The, the Reds win it! The Reds win it! The Reds win it! A home run to center field by Tony Perez! The Reds win it! The Reds win it! 14 to 13! Perez with a home run to center field! The Reds have scored five times in the ninth inning! And the Reds win on a Tony Perez home run to center field. Oh, my golly. Holy cow, what a finish. And all that night after the doubleheader, fans were calling the station to hear the replay and all into the next day. And I think that was a game that made me feel like I belonged and that I had arrived at this job with some measure of acceptance. In 1974, despite winning 98 games, the Reds finished second to the Dodgers. This predated the wild card system, so the Reds failed to make the playoffs. But in the next two seasons, Marty would call the action for one of the greatest teams in baseball history. Baseball tradition runs deep in Cincinnati. After all, way back in 1869, the Cincinnati Red Stockings became baseball's first professional team and they were charter members of the National League in 1876. In their long and glorious history, the peak of greatness for the Reds franchise occurred in 1975 and 1976. In becoming the first National League team in over half a century to win back-to-back -back world championships, they earned a nickname for the ages, the Big Red Machine. That moniker was created by Hal McCoy, Reds beat writer extraordinaire of the Dayton Daily News and a Hall of Famer himself. Reds manager Sparky Anderson could feature a starting lineup with a gallery of stars. Pete Rose, Ken Griffey, Joe Morgan, Johnny Bench, Tony Perez, George Foster, Dave Concepcion, and Cesar Geronimo. Because of the Big Red Machine's prodigious offense, the pitching staffs were often underappreciated. The starters were steady, guys like Gary Nolan, Don Gullett, Jack Billingham, and Fred Norman. But the bullpen was a major force. Closer Raleigh Eastwick led the league in saves in both title seasons, 
and he had ample support from Pedro Borbon and Clay Carroll. So Marty Brenneman and his partner Joe Nuxall had plenty to get excited about in the mid-70s. Let's listen to some of Marty's rousing play-by-play from that special Reds era, beginning with a look back at 1975. Here's a clutch game winner by the two-time most valuable player, Joe Morgan. Throws out at second base, representing the winning run. The pitch to Morgan. Swung out, a base hit to right center field. Here comes Pete Rose, and this one belongs to the Reds. Beginning in May, in a particularly dominant stretch, the Reds won an astonishing 41 out of 50. He hits a line shot. Morgan backhands in the hole, throws to Dreesen, and this one belongs to the Reds. Gary Nolan with an out-of-sight pitching performance tonight as he goes the distance for the fourth time. His first shutout, and the Reds have their seventh consecutive victory. Being tough to beat in your home park is always the sign of a strong club. At Riverfront Stadium, the 75 Reds set a league record with a nearly unbelievable win-loss figure of 64-17. and They finished 20 games ahead of the vanquished Dodgers and clinched the Western Division title on September 7th, the earliest clinching date in National League history. With 108 regular season wins, they were more than ready to play the Pittsburgh Pirates in the National League Championship Series. In those days, the LCS was a best-of-five format, and after two victories at home, the Reds were looking to wrap up a sweep in Game 3 at Three Rivers Stadium. In the eighth inning off John Candelaria, Pete Rose provided the game's turning point. Redman leading at first base. Candelaria pitches to Rose. One on fly ball, left field, well hit. It's got a chance. The Reds go out in front, three to two. Pete Rose has just taken Candelaria into the seats in left field with Redman on base, and the Reds have bolted out in front by a score of three to two. Pedro Borbon got the final out to nail down the pennant. Petey looking for the sign. He kicks and deals. The pitch is hit to Morgan. He's up. He throws to Tony. And the 1975 pennant belongs to the Reds. Due to the Major League's national broadcasting contract at that time, there was no local radio coverage of the 1975 World Series. But as the Reds' lead announcer, Marty was hired by NBC TV to work with Kurt Gowdy, Tony Kubek, and Joe Garagiola. It was one of the greatest World Series ever played between the Cincinnati Reds and the Boston Red Sox. Here's Marty's television calls of back-to-back homers by Dave Concepcion and Cesar Geronimo in Game 3. He hits one a ton back into left center field. Looking up is Jastrzemski and gone a home run. Dave Concepcion taking the grand tour as he takes Rick Wise downtown with a shot to left center field and the Reds go out in front three to one. Wise needs a strike. Geronimo a pitch away from a walk. He swings. He hits one back into deep right field. Going back is Devins, and it's out of here. Well, Kurt and Tony, Cincinnati putting on a long ball exhibition here as they have had three hits off Rick Wise and all of them home runs. Game six has been called by many people the greatest World Series contest ever played. Marty recalls his role. I was called by NBC to go down to the clubhouse. The Reds had a 6-3 to three lead. I think it was the sixth inning or the seventh inning, whatever it was. And they said, go down to the clubhouse and, and just stay there so you'll be ready for the postgame celebration. Well, I get down there. I never left. I saw Carbo hit the pinch hit home run off Raleigh Eastwick to tie it. And I stayed down there and, and saw uh, Fisk hit the home run off Pat Darcy to win it. In a seven-game classic, the Reds beat the Red Sox to capture their first World Series title since 1940. Recently, Marty spoke fondly about the Big Red Machine. The thing that I remember most about it is that game after game after game, those two years, people would come to see him play in record numbers, and they could be behind three, four, five runs going into the seventh or eighth inning, and nobody would go anywhere. You would not see people get up and leave because they had been conditioned to the probability that they would come back and win. And more often than not, they did. It was a team that never got too high when it was on a roll, which was most of the time, and never got too low if they were to lose three or four or five games in a row. 
They knew how good they were. They carried themselves like champions. They never rubbed anybody's nose in it. They never gave the other team the feeling, well, we're going to go out and hit Perez with a pitch or we're going to hit Morgan with a pitch or Bench or Rose because they're trying to humiliate us. Sparky had a rule. If we're six runs or more in front from the sixth inning on, he said, my team will not attempt a stolen base and my team will not swing at 3-0 and pitches. So he never went out with the intention of trying to embarrass anybody. And the other teams respected them for it because they realized that how great they were. And they also realized that there were very few teams, if any, who could play with them. The 1976 Cincinnati Reds led the league in all major offensive categories, including runs, doubles, triples, homers, stolen bases, and a 280 team batting average. In June of 76, First baseman Tony Perez broke up a game against St. Louis. With the tying runs on and nobody out, Griffey second, Davey first, the strike one pitch. Swung on and hit into deep center field. Way back, it is going to be, this one belongs to the Reds. Tony Perez has hit a home run to dead center field, and the Reds have done it again. As Perez hit one over the 404 marker in straightaway center field, and Cincinnati has pulled it out of the ninth inning by a final score of 8-7. to seven. Oh, boy. The Reds waltz to another division crown before making the Philadelphia Phillies their victims in the NLCS. Up two games to none, the Reds were down by a run in the ninth inning of Game 3, but catcher Johnny Bench always seemed to have a flair for the dramatic. Bench is back in, and Reed serves it up. Swung on, fly ball, deep left center field. Maddox on the warning track, looking up, it's gone! Johnny Bench with a home run to left center, and the Reds have tied it up on back-to-back ninth inning home run. They're on their feet in Riverfront, and it is tied at six runs apiece. The Reds then loaded the bases with one away, and as Ken Griffey waited at the plate, Marty Brenneman was about to make one of his greatest calls ever. Underwood with a slow come down to the belt. He throws. Griffey swings. Slow chopper. Right side. Here comes Concepcion. Poland boots the ball. And the 1976 pennant belongs to the Reds. It was a high chop along the first baseline. Bobby Tolan could not come up with it cleanly. Concepcion scores, and it is pandemonium down on the field. As the Reds have scored three in the ninth inning and have swept the Philadelphia Phillies to move into the 1976 World Series. Fans standing all over the ballpark as the Philadelphia Phillies went to the bottom of the ninth, leading by two runs, and boy, what a comeback by the big red machine. How about the drama in Marty's voice as he said, here comes Concepcion, then his signature, but instead of this one belongs to the Reds, he embellished it with the 1976 pennant belongs to the Reds. I also like the way Marty, in the heat of the moment, quickly recreated the play so the listener could visualize the high chop along the first baseline before concluding the entire passage with the reference to the Big Red Machine. Just a sparkling broadcast moment. In the 1976 World Series, the Reds simply overmatched the New York Yankees, sweeping the Bronx boys in four straight games. In the ninth inning of Game 4, with the Reds leading by a run, Series MVP Johnny Bench, who had already homered earlier in the contest, broke the game wide open. With no local broadcasting allowed once again, here's Marty's call on CBS Radio. Danny Dreesen holding his ground at first base, and here's a pitch to Bench. Swung on and hit a deep left field. That might be his second of the game. It's gone a home run. Johnny Bench with his second home run of the night. Moments later, the world champion Cincinnati Reds walked off the field at historic Yankee Stadium, the home of some of baseball's greatest teams, a description that also applied to the Big Red Machine. It took many years for Marty to put his first few seasons into perspective. I guess as a young announcer, I didn't fully appreciate what I went through in 75 and 76 because two of the first three years I was with the club, I got a World Series ring. I'll never forget Byron Somm, a longtime broadcaster with the Philadelphia Phillies, uh, said to me uh, during the 76 World Series, he said, young man, do you realize how lucky you are? 
And I said, uh, rather flippantly, I guess, at the time, yeah, yeah, I realize how lucky I am. I said, what do you mean? He said, this is your third year as a broadcaster for the Reds, and you're on your way to getting your second World's Championship ring. He said, I've been with the Phillies for X number of years, and I've never gotten one. I didn't appreciate at the time what that club did in 75 or what that club did in 76. As the years passed after that, I realized how truly fortunate I was. To diehard Reds fans, it's music to their ears when they hear Marty Brenneman say, And this one belongs to the Reds! He has been happily saying that phrase after every Reds victory for the past 33 seasons, and he remembers the first time he used it. I know it was the first season, and I think it was maybe two or two and a half or three weeks into 1974 year. I do know that it happened on a night in which Davey Concepcion got a base hit at home in the bottom of the ninth or in the bottom of an extra inning, and the game ended, and it just came out. And in retrospect, in reflecting back on that night within the matter of hours after the broadcast ended, I thought to myself, uh, that's not too bad. Let's hear how it sounded in a couple of dramatic ball games. Done up there with the bases loaded, the outfield deep and around toward right, and the 1 0 on the way to the plate. Swung on, long drive, right field, and this one belongs to the Reds. And the pitch, and Larkin swings and hits a drive, deep left field. This one belongs to the Reds. This is the old left-hander rounding third and heading for home. Good night, everyone. That's the way Joe Nuxall has been signing off on Reds Radio since 1967. His first season in the booth after a 16-year big league career spent primarily with the Reds. Nuxall was an accomplished pitcher with 135 wins, including 20 shutouts. Joe also has the distinction of being the youngest player of the 20th century to appear in a major league game. Amazingly, he was only 15 years old in June of 1944 when he worked two-thirds of an inning in a game for the Reds against the St. Louis Cardinals. When Marty Brenneman was hired in 1974 as the new voice of the Reds, he and Joe Nuxall began a broadcasting partnership that lasted a remarkable 31 years, the longest in baseball history. You'd be hard-pressed to find two people in any part of the entertainment world who have worked together longer than Marty and Joe. When Marty talks about his running mate, the affection he feels for him is obvious. Joe Nuxall is the most special person professionally that I've ever known. I mean, uh, people talk about Pete Rose being an icon in the city of Cincinnati. Pete Rose doesn't come close to Joe Nuxall. In all the years I've known Joe, I've never heard one person ever utter a negative about him. Not one time. And that's the most amazing thing in the world. I feel blessed for having worked with him all the years that I did. He and I have had just tremendous memories. We were referred to by an author as like an old married couple. And then that's probably about as close to being accurate as anything that I could apply to it. Marty and Joe became cultural icons in the Queen City. Their contrasting styles blended perfectly. Marty, the ultra-smooth professional broadcaster, and Joe, the Hamilton, Ohio native ex-player who openly rooted for his beloved Reds. Baseball seasons are long, and the announcers have a lot of airtime to fill. It's important to have some fun along the way. Marty and Joe had as much fun as anyone. The whole town's batty about Cincinnati. What a team, what a team, what a team. During rain delays, Marty and Joe would take calls on the banana phones and interact with Reds fans. Another enjoyable running gag for the listeners was the topic of Marty's tomatoes. How about the tomatoes? We haven't heard a whole lot about them. Are they bad this year or what? I mean, normally you're just, I mean, you know. I picked one off that board today that big. Oh, wait a minute. No. Ask, ask Sherry when you see her. Well, I like to see one. I'll take First, a picture and bring it in here to no, you. I, I, it's no good. I might want to take it down to the clubhouse and... Get Bernie to get me a salt shaker and go to work on it. Uh, I got gotcha. you. I understand. You understand. Now I can appreciate All that. All right. For 31 seasons, Marty Brenneman and Joe Nuxall were an immensely popular broadcast team on the Reds radio network. 
It's one of the largest networks in professional sports, with 45 affiliates in six states. The flagship for nearly four decades has been 50,000-watt WLW in Cincinnati. In his Hall of Fame career, Tom Seaver was the winning pitcher in 311 big league games. By 1978, he had already won three Cy Young Awards, pitched in five All-Star games, been a 20-game winner five times, and he was the ace of the 1969 world champion New York Mets. But Tom Seaver had never pitched a no-hitter. Oh, he had come close with five one-hitters, and on three occasions he had potential no-nos broken up in the ninth inning. Pitching for the Reds then on the night of June 16, 1978, at Riverfront Stadium against the St. Louis Cardinals, Seaver was at his very best and had not allowed a hit through eight innings. The dramatic ninth began with Seaver walking pinch hitter Jerry Mumphrey, but then he retired the great Lou Brock on a fly ball to left field. Here is Marty Brenneman's call of the final two outs. You've got speed at first base in Jerry Mumphrey and blistering speed at the plate in Gary Templeton. It would be very tough to double him up. Knight now about even with a bag at third, but creeping in slowly as Seaver comes back to Templeton. Bouncing ball, shortstop, Concepcion, Morgan will hold the throw at second base as they get the force out on Mumphrey, two away in the Cardinal ninth inning, and Seaver is one out away. The batter is George Hendrick as they start to their feet here at Riverfront Stadium. Seaver, one out away from the first no-hitter of his major league career and what would be the 14th in the long history of the Cincinnati Reds. George Hendrick, big, strong, right-handed batter, has gone hitless in three times. He has struck out once. Seaver pitches. Hendrick takes the strike. Now the crowd begins to roar with every pitch. Mumphrey has been forced at second. Templeton, the runner at first, two out. The strike one pitch coming to Hendrick. He swings and pops it foul, but it's going to be out of play as Donnie Warner runs to the near end of the Cincinnati dugout, and it falls back in the stand. Strike two. There has never been a no-hit game pitched by a Cincinnati Reds pitcher here at Riverfront. The last Reds no-hitter thrown was back on the 30th of April, 1969, by Jim Maloney at Crosley Field. He no-hit the Houston Astros 10 to nothing. Seaver is a strike away. He stretches. He checks the runner. He pitches. He pitches high a fastball, and it's one and two. They are standing all over the ballpark. Hendrick waiting on Seaver's one-two pitch. Tom sets, he kicks and fires. He pops it up, and it's going to be out of play, directly back of the plate. So Tom Seaver, now a strike away from his first major league no-hitter. The Reds leading at 4 to nothing in the ninth inning. Hendrick puts ahead of the bat on the plate. Werner hangs the sign. Seaver with a pause, the check and the pitch. He bounces to first base. Friesen has it. He goes to the bag, and Seaver's got it. Bob Seaver has pitched his first major league no-hitter, and this one belongs to the rest. Seaver is being mobbed at first base as George Hendrick bounces a routine two-hopper to Danny Greeson and the 38,216 at Riverfront Stadium are standing. Ironically, Tom Seaver and Jim Maloney both attended the same high school in California. Maloney, who pitched three no-hitters in a Reds uniform, graduated from Fresno High in 1958, four years before Seaver did. During Seaver's no-hitter, Pete Rose cracked a two-run double, giving him a very modest two-game hitting streak. Well, that would soon snowball into a 44-game hitting streak, the modern-day National League record and 12 behind the major league mark of Joe DiMaggio's unassailable 56-gamer. Rose, who had joined the 3,000-hit club earlier in that 78 season, 
came up against future Hall of Famer Phil Necro of the Atlanta Braves on July 31, 1978. He swings and grabs one to the right side. to keep the hitting streak alive at 44 in a row. Marty recently explained why he enjoyed watching Pete Rose perform. Because of the way he played the game and, and never, ever at any time once I came here in 1974 did I ever see a game where I felt that he didn't give less than everything he had on a given night. I can't say that about too many players. It's kind of interesting because I had people in the Reds organization that said to me that we're not big Pete Rose fans when I came in 1974. Well, you know, he's a selfish player because all he cares about is hitting 300, getting 200 hits, and scoring 100 runs. I said, wait a minute, time out. If he does all three of them, all he does is enhance the team's chances of winning. So I would say Pete, without any question, was my favorite Reds player. Pete Rose passed Ty Cobb as baseball's all-time hits leader on September the 11th, 1985, ironically the 57th anniversary of Cobb's final game. It was the biggest individual achievement in the big leagues in the 21-year span between Henry Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's homer record in 1974 and Cal Ripken Jr. eclipsing Lou Gehrig's consecutive games played mark in 1995. More than 47,000 Riverfront Stadium fans were there to witness baseball history as Rose, batting left-handed, faced San Diego's Eric Shaw. With an excited Joe Nuxall at his side, Marty Brenneman made the call. He levels the bat a couple of times. Shaw kicks and he fires. Rose swings. There it is! There it is! Get out! Get out! Get out. San Diego Padres coming all the way from the third base dugout to personally congratulate Pete Rose. And the kind of outpouring of adulation that I don't think you'll ever see an athlete get any more of. Little Pete fighting his way through the crowd and Pete being hoisted on the shoulders of a couple of his teammates. With Joe and everyone else around him going wild, Marty somehow stayed in control the entire time. And that's not easy for a broadcaster at a moment like that. How about the vocabulary Marty used? Not very many other baseball announcers would have even considered using words like unabated, encircled, outpouring of adulation, and hoisted at that intensely dramatic moment. One of the most fascinating things about baseball is the game's unpredictability. You never know when you might see a triple play, or a man hit four homers in a game, or as Marty Brenneman witnessed in September of 1988, a man pitching a perfect game. Reds left-hander Tom Browning was hooked up against the Los Angeles Dodgers' Tim Belcher at Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati. A smallish crowd of 16,000-plus waited out a lengthy rain delay, and at 10.02 p.m., the game finally began. Browning and Belcher were both dominant, bulldozing their way through five scoreless, hitless innings. The Reds finally got their first hit, a Barry Larkin double, in the sixth inning, and Larkin then scored the game's only run on a throwing error by Dodger third baseman Jeff Hamilton. Marty remembers the tension he felt in the late innings up in the Reds' radio booth. I was so nervous, my hand shook trying to keep my scorebook. That's the only time that's ever happened. But, but I realized from the seventh inning on what was happening and how special it would be. Suddenly, Browning had mowed down 24 straight Dodgers, a team that was to become world champions just a month later, and he was three outs away from glory. Just three months earlier, on June 6th, Tom Browning had a ninth-inning no-hitter spoiled on a one-out single by San Diego's Tony Gwynn. 
and Browning's Reds teammate, right-hander Ron Robinson, had flirted with perfection himself on May 2nd of that season in a game against Montreal. But with two outs in the ninth, the Expos' Wallace Johnson, with two strikes on him, lined a clean single to sabotage Robinson's perfecto. But Tom Browning was not to be denied. He began the ninth inning by retiring Rick Dempsey on a fly ball to right, and then Steve Sachs bounced out to short. Hinch hitter Tracy Woodson then stood between Tom Browning and baseball history. They are all up and on their feet and rooting individually and collectively for Browning to get one final out. He is ready for the 2-2 to Woodson, and here it comes. And it is swung out and missed. And Tom Browning has pitched a perfect game. 27 outs in a row, and he is being mobbed by his teammates just to the third base side of the mound. A perfect game thrown by Tom Browning on this Friday night, September the 16th, 1988, as he no-hits the Los Angeles Dodgers one to nothing and throws the first perfect game in the long and legendary history of this great Cincinnati Reds baseball franchise. And now Browning being hoisted to the shoulders of his teammates. And boy, what a memorable scene on a wet, dreary evening here in Cincinnati, a night that the fans had to wait two hours and 27 minutes for, and brother, was the wait worthwhile. And this one belongs to the Reds. Ken Griffey Jr. has been one of the premier sluggers of his generation. With Seattle in the late 1990s, he amazingly had back-to-back 56 homer seasons. With the Cincinnati Reds on June 20, 2004, Griffey was on the brink of a major milestone as he faced the Cardinals' Matt Morris. The pitch, and a high drive, hit back into deep right field. Jr. has just knocked the door down to the 500 club. A high drive into the lower deck and right. Number 30 touches them all, and boy, what a Father's Day gift for Senior. The dugout empties as he rounds third, getting the glad hand from Mark Berry. Greeted at home played by Adam Dunn, now Jason LaRue, followed by Sean Casey, and each of them will get a piece of Ken Griffey Jr. before he gets back into the dugout. Hitting his 500th home run to right field. Leading off this sixth inning, and last but not least, manager Dave Miley. And now Junior running down toward the area where his mom and dad sit, and he is there with his father for a big Father's Day hug. What a scene this is here at Bush Stadium in St. Louis. After the Griffey episode, Marty discussed his approach of broadcasting big baseball moments that are anticipatable. I don't believe in pre-planning on something that you anticipate is going to happen. Some guys do. Very few, if they do, can make it sound like it's not contrived. July 23, 2000 was the day Marty Brenneman was inducted into the broadcaster's wing of the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. He was the 24th man to be so honored, and at the age of 58, the second youngest. Vin Scully had been 54 when he entered the hall in 1982. When Tony Perez and Sparky Anderson became Hall of Famers on the same day as Marty, it only elevated the experience. Months earlier, Marty remembered the phone call he received from Cooperstown informing him of his impending status. So at 11.05, my phone rang, and I picked it up, and I said, hello, and the voice on the other end said, Marty Brenneman, please. I said, this is he, and the voice said, Marty, this is Dale Petrosky, the president of the National Baseball Hall of Fame, and that's all I remembered. I don't remember anything else. I knew he wasn't calling to see how I was doing, and my whole career flashed in front of me. You hear about people who are on the verge of dying in their whole lives. My whole career flashed in front of me from my days in Chapel Hill as a student to the beginning of my radio career in Salisbury, North Carolina, doing American Legion baseball and high school and small college football and basketball and 
uh, going to Norfolk and doing pro basketball and AAA baseball and Virginia Tech and William and Murray football and then coming to Cincinnati. All of that flashed in front of me. And I really, truly, and I told Dale this since then, I said, I don't remember anything you said after you identified yourself as to who you were. At the induction ceremony, Marty made a point of thanking his family during his acceptance speech. My dad is no longer with us, but he'd be awfully, awfully proud to be here today. He was a great baseball fan. He was a Ted Williams fan. My mom is here, thank God. And I've gotten as much joy out of watching her enjoy this weekend as, as anybody. I had great parents who allowed us to feel our way along and discover what we wanted to do with our lives with, without any pressure. My brother, Time, I thought so much of him, I named my only son after him. My in-laws, John and Gloria Robinson, are here, my sister-in-law, Kyle, and my kids. My son, Tom, who has had a broadcast career that has absolutely blown mine away. He'll be up here one day. You can take that to the bank. And we'll welcome in a new member of the family in November because Tom's here with his fiance, Polly Rassi. My oldest daughter, Dawn, big success in the business world, a bigger success as a wife to my son-in-law, Dave, and the two greatest grandsons in the world, and Cal and Dylan, and Dylan is tapped out right over there. <laughs> my youngest daughter, Ashley, probably our biggest challenge, but a young lady who's turned out to be sensational, and she too, in, in college at Ohio U, is beginning to prepare now for a career in sports, and she'll be awfully good at it. You're truly blessed if you have good kids, and I do. Sparky once said to my wife, Sherry, you deserve a medal for being married to him. He was right then, and he is now. I think all of us up here know it takes a special kind of woman to take care of things because of the amount of time that we spend on the road. And Sherry is that special kind of woman. I'm sure I don't say it enough how thankful I am, but I am. I have a great family, and I love you all very much. Marty Brenneman was honored in 2005 by being inducted into the prestigious Radio Hall of Fame. On 17 occasions, he's been named his state's Sportscaster of the Year, four times in his native Virginia and 13 times in the Buckeye State. In early October 2006, on a great day for both father and son, the Cincinnati Reds announced Marty's son, Tom Brenneman, would be joining his dad in the team's broadcast booth beginning in 2007. Marty's pride of his son extends well beyond his broadcasting success. I have been thrilled by his success. I've been more thrilled by the fact that he's kept his head screwed on right, and he's a legitimately nice guy who is receptive to people, who is concerned about other people. I constantly have had camera people and assistant directors and booth people say to me, uh, yeah, he's really a good guy. And that's more important to me than, than the fact that he's a good broadcaster. Tom's impressive career has included both local baseball coverage and countless national television events on the Fox network. Since the late 80s, Tommy has been a broadcaster for the Reds, Cubs, and Diamondbacks. His Fox TV resume includes Major League Baseball, including postseason games, National Football League contests, college basketball, and in January of 2007, Tom Brenneman will do the play-by-play -play of the college football championship game. I got to listen frequently to Marty Brenneman on Reds Radio when I worked in Columbus, Ohio in the early 1980s. I was trying to become a big league broadcaster myself, and listening to a guy as good as Marty was a very favorable influence. He sounded educated and confident, and there was an effortless quality to his performance. I was always impressed at Marty's ability to string phrases together. I'd hear him say, an opposite field, game-tying, eighth-inning, three-run homer. His descriptions were vivid and easy to picture in your mind. He'd say, McGee slaps a curve on the ground to a charging Concepcion. Now right there in one sentence, he told you several things. Slaps a curve indicates that Willie McGee was kind of out in front of the breaking pitch and did not take his best swing. 
on the ground lets you see the bouncing ball, and a charging Concepcion tells you the ball was not hit that sharply, and thus the shortstop had to quickly run in to field it in order to make the throw to first base. Ever since I joined the National League with the Chicago Cubs in 1996, Marty has always treated me very well. But I'm just one of countless people on whom he has had a positive effect. Just this past summer, in a game at the Great American Ballpark in Cincinnati, a young handicapped Reds fan had requested an opportunity to meet Marty Brenneman. In the hallway just outside of our radio booths, I saw Marty smiling and chatting with this kid who was confined to a wheelchair. I heard Marty say, you just keep on rooting for the Reds. The look on that kid's face told me it was his best day in a long time. In 33 seasons, despite numerous opportunities to work elsewhere, Marty has never really come close to leaving the Cincinnati Reds. Sometime in the late spring of 2007, Marty Brenneman will have been the voice of the Reds for a third of a century. He is still going strong and he sounds as great as ever, but he knows eventually his career will come to an end. Marty recently discussed how he would like to be remembered someday. That I was as objective as a club announcer can possibly be, that I was not a homer. I would want people to think that I was credible, that what I said was what I truly believe. Reds fans won't forget Marty for a long, long time. And he seems to appreciate very much just how fortunate he has been. And I've been blessed ever since I've been in Cincinnati. I can't imagine a place that I would have enjoyed uh, living and enjoyed my craft as much as the city of Cincinnati and of all the places I could have been called to in 1974, you know, to get called to Cincinnati and be around great teams and great players and uh, the association with Joe and and the freedom to broadcast the game the way I felt like it needed to be broadcast, there have been no negatives for me. I mean, I have truly, absolutely been blessed in my career. And uh, if I had to do it all over again, I don't think I'd change a thing. Marty Brenneman will be remembered not only for the classic calls we've heard on this program, but also for simply perpetuating the magic of baseball on the radio. This is Pat Hughes saying thank you for listening to Marty Brenneman, the voice of the Reds. Please join me again next time on Baseball Voices, the Hall of Fame series. Sandy into his windup. Here's the pitch. Swung out and missed the perfect game. Swung on. There's a high drive to left. Salavito going back. And the ball is going, going down. He can't get it. It's off the wall for a base hit. Here comes the tying run, and here comes the winning run. There's a new home run champion of all time, and it's Henry Aaron. I don't believe what I just saw. I don't believe what I just saw. I would like to thank the following people for helping to make this production possible. Marty Brenneman and his entire family. Bud Selig, the commissioner of Major League Baseball. The Cincinnati Reds organization with special thanks to the Director of Media Relations, Rob Butcher, and the Creative Services Coordinator, Jared Rollins. WLW Radio in Cincinnati, with a sincere thank you to the producer-engineer for the Reds on Radio, Dave Armbruster, Joe Nuxall, Mike Dodson of Host Communications. A big thank you to Kurt Smith, America's foremost baseball broadcast historian and author of both Voices of the Game and Voices of Summer. The National Baseball Hall of Fame, with special thanks to Jeff Idelson and Benjamin Harry. Additional audio cuts provided by John Miley, sports broadcast historian and president of the Miley Collection. George Castle, sports journalist and author. 
And thank you to Stephen Leventhal, engineer, recorded at the studios of SRN Broadcasting, Lake Bluff, Illinois. This copyrighted broadcast is licensed by Major League Baseball. Any reproduction or other commercial use of this recording in whole or in part is strictly prohibited. For more information about this product, please visit our website at www.baseballvoices.com. That's baseballvoices.com.